Well, anyone who's been around here, while well, I've been here anyway, probably knows that I'm a big fan of sci-fi, sci-fi books and movies. Things like tractor beams and laser rifles and beam me up, Scotty. That's what gets my, my imagination going. That's what I like to read, like to watch. And so today, I'd like you to come with me on a little bit of a sci-fi adventure. Another theme present in many sci-fi movies is that of time travel. And so today, if you will, travel with me back in time. Back in time, a thousand years, not two thousand years, but actually further than that, 3,500 years. The scene is that Israel has just left Egypt. They've just been brought out of Egypt by the hand of God. They've crossed over the Red Sea, and now they're at the foot of Mount Sinai. And it's here that they receive the law from God, and Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, and he converses with God. He learns from God. He's in God's presence. It's here that we get the law. It's here that we get the instructions for the building of the tabernacle. But what I want to focus on this morning isn't so much what God gave there, but what happened to Moses while he was up on the mountain. See, being in the presence of God, learning from God in that intimate way, that close to God, it changes a person. Moses was very changed as well. And while I'm sure character-wise, in his heart, he was changed, he was also changed physically in a rather frightening and astounding way. Uh, that text in Exodus tells us that when Moses came down off the mountain, his face was shining with this great light, with the glory of God. And this was so frightening to all of Israel, even to Aaron, his right-hand man who had been with him through all the miracles in Egypt, who had been standing next to him during the Red Sea. Even Aaron was so afraid at this glory of God manifest in Moses' face that they all ran away. And Moses had to call them back in order to give them the instructions that God had handed down. And so, for the people of Israel, at all times, except when he was giving the word of God or when he was conversing with God on the mountain, Moses wore this veil around his face so that the people wouldn't be afraid of the glory of God reflected in his face. Moses was a very curious man, and we all know what curiosity does, at least to the poor cat. Moses was curious about this glory of God. He wanted to know more of the glory of God. And so he asks God in Exodus, he says, God, show me your face. Show me your glory. I want to see you. I want to know what you look like. And I want to know what your glory is completely. And so God, of course, answers that no man can see my face. No man can see my glory and live. You're sinful, fallen man. You can't live through that. But I'll do something for you. I'll lift you up on this mountain and I'll put you in the cleft of this rock and I'll cover your face as I pass by. And then when I'm beyond you, I'll remove my hands so that you can see my back. That was the closest we could get, closest anyone could get, to seeing the glory of God, a reflection in Moses' face or the back of God, probably from a distance. The closest we could get to seeing the glory of God. But things change as time goes on. And so now, fast forward another jump through time with me. This time, 1,500 years from this point, we see the glory of God manifest in a manger, in a stable, in the most awkward of places, the place you wouldn't look for the glory of God. And yet our text in John tells us this morning that the full glory of God took on human flesh, came to dwell among us. And in Jesus we see what Moses wanted to see but was denied. We see what terrified all of Israel. We see the glory of God in the face of a little wiggling baby in a manger. Jesus was brought into this world as the light of God, the full glory of God, manifest or dwelt among us, among earth. And that word dwelt in the Greek is actually very similar or the same word in the Septuagint used for the tabernacle to describe the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was the physical dwelling place of God on earth, the place of his presence among the people of Israel that would lead them, that would guide them, and it housed the glory of God. And so the glory of God in Christ Jesus literally tabernacled among humanity. This wasn't in some vague, spiritual, incorporeal way as a writer of Christian Science recently published last weekend on Yahoo. As she wrote that Christ is the true idea, voicing good, the divine message from God to men, speaking to the human consciousness. She writes that Christ is incorporeal, is spiritual, the divine image and likeness, 
but dispelling the illusion of the senses. We don't believe that Christ was only spiritual, was incorporeal, but that Christ literally took on humanity, became flesh and blood, not to dispel the illusion of our senses, but that we might experience him with our senses. The disciples walked with him. They heard his voice. They saw what he did. They touched him. They interacted with him. So the full glory of God came not, not in some weird, vague, spiritual way, but physically to dwell among us. As we fast forward then another 2,000 years into the future, we learn that times really haven't changed very much in a lot of ways. Our text tells us that Christ came into a world of darkness to bring the light of God into the darkness. But the darkness didn't receive him. The darkness didn't understand him. The darkness didn't know him. It's very consistent with our day today. That darkness, the darkness of the world, the darkness of our sin, is still very present. It's very present in things like the wars that we witness all around. In the killing of babies that happens every day in our nation and across the world. But it's present in our lives as well. As fallen humanity, we, we like the darkness. We cling to the darkness. We cling to our sins. We don't want our sins, those secret things, brought into the light. And so we try to hide them. We try and hide them from other people around us. And sometimes we try and hide them from God. Christ came, though, not only to reveal those sins, not only to bring them to light, but to do something about them. God in his holiness had to do something about sin. He had to judge sin. But in his love, he did the only thing that we couldn't do. He did what we couldn't do and made a sacrifice for that sin, for all our sins, that would fulfill the judgment, fulfill the wrath of God. And through faith in Jesus Christ, through his light coming into our lives, we receive that forgiveness of sins that was won by Christ on the cross. What are those places of darkness in your life today? The places that maybe you're too afraid or too ashamed to look at, to confess to God. I invite you to think about those as we progress through the Christmas season and realize God has come to bring light to those areas of your life to forgive them, to change you just as Moses was changed on the mountain. Maybe our faces aren't shining with reflected glory of God, but that character change, that heart change, happens in us through Christ as we draw closer to his light, his glory that drives out all sin, that finally defeats the power of death and the devil. And so we look at the light and the glory of God shining into the darkest of places, into the tomb, and indeed shining out of the tomb as the light of Christ comes into the world and defeats that power, defeats and drives out the darkness of sin, death, and the devil. And he does this for us because he loves us and because he wants a relationship with us. Just as Moses was transformed, we're transformed too. As we draw closer to the light of Christ, as we partake in the spiritual dis disciplines, as we read scripture, as we go to the Lord in prayer, partake in communion, Christ shines his light into our life and we reflect that light then into the world around us to show the other people the light of Christ to the people around us with the hopes that they too will be drawn into Christ to hear his message and to have the forgiveness of sins that he offers to everyone. This light, though, was not just a one-time thing. It was not manifest once and then gone forever. And so one final jump through time, an unknown amount of time into the future, when finally Christ returns in all of his glory, when all of us, and indeed all people, all the world, will see the full glory of God and not only see the glory of God, but dwell in that glory for all of eternity when Christ remakes the heavens and the earth and then dwells with us, walks with us just as he did in the garden. The last chapter of Revelation tells us about this, tells us about the kingdom of God and says in the kingdom of God, his servants will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. The night, the darkness, sin, death, the power of the devil will be no more. They, the servants of God, the people that dwell in his kingdom, will need no light or lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light and he will reign forever and forever. 
In that time, we return to life in the garden. We return to fully dwelling in the presence of God. And so we celebrate today not only the coming of Christ in the manger, but the hope and the promise that he gives us that he will again return to dwell with us so that we can see his glory and dwell with him in his glory for all of eternity. Amen. May the peace of God then, which surpasses all human understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.